What's going on, everyone? Sam Rothstein here, acting principal clarinet with the Indianapolis Symphony Orchestra, bringing you another episode of the Candid Clarinetist podcast. Wanted to give a quick shout out to my friends Steve Williamson and Todd Levy for their appointments to the clarinet faculty of my alma mater, Northwestern University. News just came out today. Um, in addition to being fabulous teachers and players, they're also just terrific people, and I just couldn't be happier for them and for the students there. I think they're really going to do great things and continue on the terrific legacy of that school. Uh, today, we are joined by clarinetist Eric Black. A few weeks ago, Eric posted a fascinating video on his YouTube channel comparing the cost of attending music schools like Juilliard, Peabody, and the New England Conservatory to the return you might get if you happen to get a job in a professional orchestra. It was a fantastic, objective, fact-driven presentation which illuminated a lot of realities about music school. The video has gotten over 28,000 views in the past few weeks and has even been featured on Norman Lebrecht's blog, Slipped Disc. I wanted to invite Eric on to dive a bit deeper into this topic. Topic. Eric, thanks so much for joining me today. Hey, thank you so much for having me, Sam. My pleasure. Uh, so just so we get a background on you, can you just give just a brief outline of sort of like where you are in your life and career and, uh, you know, what what uh, what you do? Sure, sure, sure. Uh, so I attended Miami University for undergrad. I studied with Michelle Gingras there. And then after that, I went to the Peabody Conservatory and studied with Eugene Mundy. Before the pandemic, I was very hard on the audition trail, right? I was trying to do what pretty much everyone who listens to your podcast is trying to do, right? I was trying to win an orchestral job. Um, and then, of course, the pandemic hit, right? So from there, I have, I wouldn't say I've transitioned because I'm still very much trying to win a job, but... I've started adding things to my sort of skill set that I I like to do, want to do, and um, would be happy doing. And so, what are, what are some of those things? Just so you can give a yeah. So, I guess the biggest thing is starting my YouTube channel, right? Mm -hmm. So there I was in I I think June of 2020 is when I released my first video. Um, I think like most people, uh, early on in the pandemic, you know, we got, let's see, I was teaching and I basically got sent home early for spring break. Right. Mm -hmm. And initially I think a lot of musicians were like, wow, look at all this free time we have. We're all stuck at home. Like, let's all practice. Let's all, you know, we finally got to play these pieces we always wanted to play or like these etudes or whatever, you know, thing you always had wanted to have time to practice. You suddenly had all the time in the world to do that. Right. And yep. so for the first couple months of the pandemic, I was doing that. You know, I was practicing really, really hard. I was putting in this time. You know, I'd been practicing hard before that because, of course, you know, I was trying to win in a uh, win a job. But suddenly I had all this time for etudes and solo pieces, and I wasn't just having to practice excerpts 24 seven. And so I was getting to do all these things I wanted to do. And then two months in, it started to feel like, okay, but things don't look like they're coming back anytime soon. Mm -hmm. So I'm practicing all these hours with no possibility for return, or at least that's what it felt like at the time. Right. Mm -hmm. And, a lot of people, uh, I think even, you know, former guests on your podcast have said like, oh, keep working, keep pushing through the pandemic, you know, like when this is all over, it will pay dividends, right? And mm -hmm. it may, and it, it may for some people, but I started to feel like, but what if it doesn't, you know? Yeah. What if there's no, you know, light or at the end of the tunnel? What do I do with this skill set I've acquired, you know? Yeah. For most of us, that end goal is winning the job, and that's what makes it all worth it. But for everyone else, you've still practiced all these hours. I mean, hundreds, if not, well, obviously more than hundreds, thousands, tens yeah. of thousands, you know, tens of thousands of hours have gone into this. And then you're just supposed to say, well, I guess I tried my best. Like, I'm, I'm not going <laughs> to do that anymore. Right. Like, where does yeah. that time go? So I really wanted to like find a way to utilize that skill set and connect with the broader community at large and also make content uh, that I felt like wasn't out there, at least not uh, on a large scale, 
and and make content that I was passionate about, you know? Yeah. Well, one thing that struck me about when I found your channel, and I don't remember how or when I found it, but uh, the quality was very high. Um, and that's something that I strive to do or that I've sort of learned to do is like anyone can like set up their phone and, you know, make a video and, you know, put it on the internet. But to, to truly make it cinematic and have great editing and great, uh, you know, B roll and all that engaging content takes a lot of skills, frankly. And, and I've had to learn those skills. So where did you, um, learn those things? Did you already have kind of a background in videography or did you just educate yourself? Yeah, that's a good question. I knew none of that prior to the pandemic. I'd never used a camera before. I didn't know how a camera worked. Like, you know, I remember like when I first decided like, Hey, maybe this is something I want to like try out, you know, see how this, see how this works. I was like Googling, like, what is an aperture? What is shutter speed? You know, like what's the benefits of shooting in 24 frames per second versus 30 versus 60, you know, like Mm -hmm. what is ISO? I don't know what any of these things are. And Mm -hmm. like, (laughs) and the same for like microphone stuff. Like what is a cardioid microphone? What is an Omni microphone? How does that change the sound? What, what makes it more accurate? Like I didn't know any of that. Like I, I think I'd had one music technologies class in undergrad, like sophomore or junior year for one semester. And whatever I learned in that, like, it was pretty much gone by that point, you know? But yeah, like, the, I mean, the technology is so obsolete because it's, right. you know, every, every two years, it's just a totally new thing. Right. So, uh, yeah, I, I, had to, I had to learn all of that. And that was actually, I had a lot of fun. I, I discovered that I, I really had a lot of fun learning that process, like getting to engage a, a different creative part of my brain, right? Like getting to basically create a story or create um, a video and it, it could be whatever I wanted, right? Mm-hmm. And so just diving into that process and learning those skills and basically my my philosophy was the same as, as practicing. Like every new video I made, I wanted it to be just a little bit better. Like, you know, so for this video, I'm going to learn how to do this thing. For this video, I'm going to learn how to do this thing. And I've seen your videos too. They're great. And you know how much work goes into each one, you know, like yeah. and learning these skill sets and these processes and these editing techniques and, and all that different stuff. And Well, especially when you're first starting out too, because you don't know that you don't have a good workflow yet or you don't have like a streamlined workflow. Right. So just trying to figure out like, okay, I got to do this animation. How do I do that? Whereas like later on, you kind of figure out, okay, I need to do this, 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 and I know how to go through everything. So like your first video that you edit takes you 10 hours because you're just trying to figure out what the heck to do. And then as you get going, you can, you know, a 10 hour video might take you an hour and a half just because you know, you know, you have a more streamlined way of doing it. Right, right. Yeah, it's, you're, you're totally right that it's overwhelming at first and it gets easier. It's like, it's like anything else. But Mm -hmm. yeah, to answer your question, I, I had no formal knowledge of any of that stuff, but I had, I discovered I had fun doing it. And so that made me want to do it more, you know? Yeah. And and so what kind of things do you post on your channel? I mean, I know, but I want everyone else to know. (laughs) Sure, sure, sure. Yeah. So, I mean, primarily my channel is clarinet centric, right? So sometimes I'll post, uh, and it's not as often anymore, but like tutorials, like my first video was a Rhapsody in Blue tutorial as I feel that many clarinetists first video is actually, right. Um, and like circular breathing, stuff like that. But I'm very interested, I think specifically in a lot of equipment, you know, because there's so much stuff out there, like so many different instruments, so many different mouthpieces, reeds, what have you. There's so much of that stuff out there. And basically no one talks about it other than like, the company distributing it right so it's very hard to find objective information on any of that stuff or at least yeah yeah and so that's primarily what my channel is and the video i did recently that you know we're talking about on this podcast is kind of um it's a little bit divergent right it's not entirely in line with what i normally do though it is still clarinet focused. 
Yeah. And I think, uh, before we transition to that, I think that, uh, you know, one thing I really appreciate, and I said this earlier, but just like the quality of video that you do and, and it's just engaging content and there isn't anything like that. Um, aside from probably maybe some of my stuff, but it's just yeah. not, it's not like there's no, you, you look, you go on YouTube and you, f let's talk about cameras. You, there are thousands of camera YouTubers and they're all amazing. They're all incredible. Right. The videos are yep. amazing. You get in-depth product reviews. These people know how to shoot. They know how to put B-roll in it. Clarinets, there's nothing except for you, basically. And so, you know, that is a niche that needs to be filled, and I'm glad that you're doing it. Um, and so uh, if you guys are interested in seeing any of Eric's stuff, is it, it's Parkhouse Creations is your YouTube channel? Yeah. Okay. Parkhouse so, Creations. Yeah. So Parkhouse Creations on YouTube, go ahead and give them a follow uh, or subscribe. Uh, to his channel, it puts out great videos. Uh, I really highly recommend it. I've learned a lot from from watching some of your videos. Um, so let's talk about your recent video, which it was sort of a commentary on music schools, and I can't remember what the title of it was, but um, it was basically you compared uh, the return of investment you get versus the tuition that it costs to go to like a top conservatory, like Juilliard or what have you. Um, so why did you decide to make this video? Yeah, it's a good question. And, um, having read a lot of the comments that came out after the video came out, you know, people had their own perceptions of why I made the video. You know, I think a lot of people, despite like really trying my best to make it clear that this wasn't a case of me just being angry or bitter or anything like that, people still want to assume that you're like upset about something. But I just felt that the way music schools are generally marketed and the expectant outcomes, they don't co-align, right? Between what you can expect from your conservatory degree and what, you know, the conservatory is kind of like saying is possible for you to achieve, right? Or saying what you might achieve. Uh, so I just, I felt a deep need to, I don't know, make that comparison, show that, you know, like the, the best case scenario, while it's, it's great. And I think a lot of people would be thrilled to have that best case scenario compared to other degrees and, um, other things you could pursue. It still doesn't really line up with the cost of what you're paying to, to be there and pursue that. And does that make sense? Yeah, it makes sense hundred percent. And I'm going to defend you a little bit here because no, there were zero opinions in that video. There were no opinions. And that's what I really liked about it. And I think everyone has a visceral reaction. I shouldn't say everybody. A lot of people have a visceral reaction to content like that because they think, Oh, he's just trying to, you know, burn the world down. And you didn't do that at all. You just said, here's what it costs to go to school. If you get a job in one of these orchestras, which is very hard to do, here's what you're going to be making. Does this equal that? Right. That's all you said. That you just gave complete fact-driven, um, objective perspective, and, and and I really appreciated that about the video. And then you let people come to their own conclusions. But we all know how the internet works, and I'm sure you right. got a lot of these visceral reactions. And I'm sure like administrators at these schools and the, st the stakeholders probably weren't happy about it, but I think that's part of the conversation of what needs to change. Um, cause I'm going to give an opinion and I, and I, cause I don't really care what anyone thinks. You don't have to give <laughs> any opinions, but I'll give the opinions for you. Um, sure. so, you know, how did you manage? I thought it was amazing how you managed to do it, but like, how did you manage to keep it all fact driven and, and just, not insert any of your own personal feelings or anything into it. Well, you're right. It's, it's a very emotional subject for a lot of people. Like, and when I, when I set out to make the video, I was coming, I was kind of coming at it from the perspective of if someone were to ask me, should I go to music school? What would I tell them? And the answer is I can't give, I, I decided that I really can't give my opinion on that. That's everyone's coming from a completely different place, you know, both socioeconomically, mentally, 
physically even, you know, like everyone's story is very, very different. And so for me to give someone, you know, like my opinion on if they should continue music school or go to music school or pursue this career, it would have very little bearing on their life. But what I can do is show them the odds, right? Show them how it breaks down and how much it'll cost and what the potential financial consequences of that decision are and, you know, and their chances. And I feel like those numbers, or at least those rough numbers, you know, because it's, it's not exact. It, it would be impossible for me to make it exact. Yeah. Um, I, I think they present a much clearer picture than I ever could just, you know, telling someone my experience personally, right? Mm -hmm. Or anyone could telling their personal experience because it's all clouded in our own lives, right? It's all it's all based around our own point of views and frame of references and our own experiences. And that in a field like this, those frame of references have very little bearing on kind of the reality of the situation for most people. Yeah. And, you know, I think that's a good answer too, because it really does depend on where you're coming from. I mean, I'll give my perspective, like, you know, I am, it's not lost on me how fortunate I was, you know, that I had parents who were able to support that. Um, and you know, I had colleagues in school with me that didn't have that and I had no idea how they did it. I have no clue. And, and so I'm, I'm very lucky. I wouldn't be where I am today without that. And so, you know, for someone like me, like it's, it's, a, it's a much easier decision than for someone who, who doesn't have that kind of support. Um, you know, and it also just depends on how much you want it and how much you think that, that getting that degree or going to that school is going to help you get to that point. And, really nobody has the answer. I mean, if you're 18 years old or 21 years old, I mean, how are you going to know? How do you, how do you know? It's right. just, it, it, there's no crystal ball. Um, and you know, I mean, knowing what I know now, I just, I'm a completely different person and I'm in a, a completely different player and I have a completely different understanding of music than I did back then. It was just, it's just a night and day. Um, right. And, and so it's, it's, it's hard that, you know, I, honestly I'm kind of incensed about it that 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 they're putting these kids in these financial positions and trying to make these um decisions these you know decisions that will affect the rest of their lives decisions that are really not qualified to make yet yeah they just meet with these financial officers and they're like oh yeah sure like here's your student loans it's going to be great and, but they don't talk them through the consequences of these various decisions. And I think part of me, that's, that's the big problem is that, is that there's not enough education, um, because all they want is people to sign on the dotted line and, and go pay the tuition. I mean, they don't, you know, I mean, there's probably some, some, uh, a bit of sympathy, but there's not a lot of, you know, their job is to, to get people's, you know, loans to go through. That's what their job is. Right. Right. And so, um, you know, if that's what I'd like to see more of is like, you understand this is the commitment that you're making. And when you leave this school, you're going to have to owe this amount of money to the government. I mean, that's a big deal. Um, and when you're 18 years old, how do you judge whether that's something you want to do or not? You know, right. so you, there needs to be more responsibility and more ownership from the people that are leading these students and these kids to make these decisions. And that's, that's the big thing that I would like to change, see changed is like, okay, here's the decision you're about to make. Let's talk through this. Not right. Like, I'm, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, no, I was, I was just going to piggybacking off that, you know, it's, I, I, I can't remember where I read it once, but you know, like college tuition is the only major loan like that you can, only major loan like that that you can take out that uh, you don't have to show like that you're good for right like right. if you're going out for a house loan they want to make sure that you can pay that house loan back you know mm -hmm. if you're going out for like a personal loan uh, those are very hard to get now I mean credit yeah. cards have basically replaced those but if you're going out for like any kind of loan you have to show like 
I'm going to be making this much money. I'm good for that money. But for college tuition and something like, you know, a performance degree in clarinet, how can you possibly show that you're going to be, you know, that you're good for that money, right? Like you can't, you can't, you can't yeah. like, maybe you will be like, there's a very small percentile chance that you will be, right. but in general, you can't. And it's not really like, uh, you know, I mean, the old joke, it's not entirely true, but it's like, what do you call the, 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 the last person in the med school class? Doctor. A doctor, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Cause, cause like that's a, that's an education where like, you know, as long as you don't completely mess up, like you'll, you'll, you know, leave and make a fair amount of money. Um, I mean, I still think med school should be free too, but that's another, that's a argument for another day. Sure, Having sure. a brother who's a, who's a surgeon, you know, I, I definitely know his, uh, his experience with that. Um, so what do you think is a good, alter for someone who's not maybe in a position to t take on that kind of financial burden, what do you think is a good alternative to music school? Maybe for someone who still wants to play clarinet. Yeah. You know, it's tough uh, because right now there isn't like a true alternative to music school and the complete experience you'll receive, right? Like there's no substitute for playing in an orchestra to get that orchestral experience, right? You can't read about orchestras. You can't listen to people talk about orchestras. You can't listen to orchestras and suddenly be able to go into an orchestra and know how to, to mesh well in that environment, to survive and thrive and, and play well. But that doesn't mean that you can't have, you know, a good musical experience otherwise. And there are people out there who I think have basically proved that. Are you familiar with um, James Orlando Garcia? Yes. Yes. So he is, and I'm, I'm not entirely familiar with his background. I, mm -hmm. I very loosely know it. I think he was part of the Chicago Youth Symphony, which is like, you know, an amazing organization, like one of the best youth symphonies in the country. And the participants in that youth uh, uh, orchestra um, have an incredible experience. But he's still, he's, I think, in his 30s, and he still plays professionally today, but it's not his main thing. You know, it's not his day job. I think he plays bass clarinet with the Des Moines Symphony. Des Moines, yeah. Yeah. And, um, he didn't get a single degree in, in music performance. You know, he didn't get a single music degree at all. He went to school for other things, but he kept playing. You know, he kept finding a way to, to make it happen. So, you know, I feel like everyone's path has to be different. If you're, if you're deciding you don't want to go to music school, but you still want to keep pursuing music, you have to find other ways around that. Like whether that's studying individually with, you know, a local symphony player or, you know, teacher you really admire, um, getting involved in community bands and orchestras, uh, you know, whatever musical opportunities you have, you know, you, you got to seize those. There is a way forward, but it, it's difficult because it's, it's, yeah, there's no true alternative, but you can make it happen anyway. Yeah. And I'll just give my opinion on this. And, and again, this is my opinion. Um, I think that everyone should get an undergraduate degree. Uh, I, sure. I think that's important to get a four year degree. Um, and I, I think that if you want to be a performer and, and you want to play clarinet for a living, I think it is important to get a degree in music performance, but there is, there are a few workarounds. I think that, uh, if you can go to school for free as an undergrad, do that. Um, sure. but the way you can do that is if there's a teacher or somebody that you really like that you want to study with, try to go to school in close to that area so that you can actually study with that teacher and you can attend their studio classes or whatever that school is. So for, let's just use it as an example. If you want to go to Northwestern, um, Todd Levy teaches at UW Milwaukee. Right. And it'd be a lot easier to get a full scholarship to UW Milwaukee and study with Todd. And then maybe for grad school, you can go to Northwestern and you can get a scholarship and it can be free. 
Yep. And that, that's a really, really great alternative. You'll be around Milwaukee. You'll be around Chicago. You can go to concerts. You can surround yourself by other great clarinetists, um, both at the school and in other venues. But it'd be a lot less expensive than just like paying to go to Northwestern. I don't know what tuition is now, but it's probably ludicrous. Um, it's very high. Yeah, yeah. it's probably like $70,000 a year. And all of a sudden you're a quarter of a million dollars in debt before you even have an undergraduate degree. Whereas you could go to school for free, get almost the same experience. Granted, you're not playing in the ensembles and stuff, but you'll still have that experience around you and you'll be able to take other opportunities to do that. So that's my opinion, that if money is a um, limiting factor, that's a perfect way to do it is you can get an undergraduate degree from somewhere. It doesn't really matter where it is. Um, and then create those opportunities outside of of your school by using that money that you save to um, to apply that. Right. I, I mean, that's, if I'm being honest, that's basically what I did. Right. Right. So in my own personal experience, like that's actually exactly what I did. I got a huge scholarship to go to a local state school. I went there and then I went to a conservatory afterwards and studied with someone, you know, that I was really excited and, and happy to study with. Not that my undergraduate, my, you know, I was super excited to study with my undergraduate teacher too, yeah. but, um, but I also was very happy and uh, I feel I very privileged to have gotten the, the scholarship I got, you know, and, and to have been able to go about it the way the way that I did. Um, but I think in general, like I said, like, I don't think there's a true replacement for music school. I think you can make it happen without music school, but it's, it becomes much, much, much more difficult and it's already very difficult. Right. Right. So do you think, um, like, a, I mean, I, I'll share my own experience. So I, so I graduated, um, and got my undergraduate degree and I actually applied for three different grad schools. It was all, you know, like, uh, see if I can remember it. I applied to Rice, USC, and Manhattan School of Music. Like probably three of the better at that point in time, uh, clarinet programs. Absolutely. I didn't get into yeah. any one of them, none of them. Mm -hmm. And, and I was upset about it, but looking yeah. back on it, it was actually probably the best thing that ever happened to me. Cause I was able to play in civic in Chicago. I was able to start working. I started freelancing and playing with Milwaukee and doing some other things around the area. And I didn't, I wasn't, I was going to have to take out loans for sure to go to the schools. Like I wasn't going to get any money. And so, right. um, you know, I, I, I think that a master's degree in performance is one of the most overrated things that you can possibly get. And that's no disrespect to anyone that has a master's degree. But if you have an undergraduate degree, going to get a master's degree, especially if you're like paying for it, I don't think is necessarily worth it. You can get the same experience if you just say you want to study with Yehuda Glad, just move to LA and go to studio classes and study with him. That's going to be a lot less expensive than going to USC. Now, if you can go to USC and get a scholarship and go for free, that's another story because then you get it the best of both worlds. But there's a lot of ways you can do it where the master's degree isn't going to give you much. Like it's not going to give you much return. Like having that degree on your resume, you know, maybe if you're considering going teaching somewhere at the collegiate level, it, it might be a prerequisite. But even then, sometimes that that's not necessarily what you need. So what do you think? Like at what point do you think like getting more degrees is like diminishing returns? Yeah, I think for... <laughs> For something to have diminishing returns, you need to have returns first, right? Right. Like, <laughs> so, uh, you know, in the video, I kind of go over how the the schools, not all of them, but some of them will list the medium, uh, median, sorry, median starting salary for their graduates. You know, and I think for New England Conservatory, after a four year degree there, the median starting salary was like 11,850, oh, something man. like that. That's rough. right. Yeah. That's, and <laughs> it's you know, like, and, <laughs> right? it's very rough. And when you go to look up some of those same median starting salaries for master's programs, right? So an extra two years, it definitely goes higher, but we're talking like, instead of 11,850, we're now at like, 24,500. So, I mean, that's double, it's over double, but it's still 
not good. But you're talking right? about another one hundred twenty thousand dollars worth of loans, right? So right. is it yeah. really? Yeah, dead? it's there's it's basically, you know, at that point it might as well be like zero return on investment. You're not getting a return on your investment at all, right? Right. Mm-hmm. Um. So uh, it becomes diminishing returns very quickly. Like I don't know if, <laughs> in general, I think like the graduate degree, there was, there was an excellent article and I'll have to look it up. Maybe you can include it in the, uh, in the bio for this podcast, but, um, it basically talks about graduate programs in general, but especially in the arts. I think this article was focused primarily on film school and how they, are not good returns on investments at all at, at any level, because there's very little that you very little tangible benefit that you get from them, you know? So, I mean, I'm going to, I'm going to stick to my, I guess my talking point on it that like, you know, you need a, you need a return before you get diminishing returns. Right. Um, and I think that, you know, I, I think this leads to a larger issue, and and this is kind of an issue of, you know, I'd, I'd like to write about it at some point, but I, I have a lot of issues with how music schools teach students. Uh, I think that the focus is kind of all wrong. Um, I think that a lot of academia is very self-serving in terms of more focus on the faculty and the prestige rather than the students, which is really what you should sure. be there for, uh, in my opinion. Um, so what do you think needs to change there where there can be a better argument for, you know, taking out these huge loans to go to a music school? Like what, how does the system need to at least shift slightly where we can equip these students with more skills or at least a broader perspective on, how this life is as a musician? Yeah, I think that's a great question. I think I want to talk about two things. Um, so the first, I think, way that schools are already combating this, depending on the school, are double degrees, right? That's, that's relatively common. Like you go to Oberlin, I think it's something like a third of students in the conservatory are pursuing double degrees. Right. So you're getting potentially, I mean, you can always like major in music and then also like English or something Mm -hmm. where uh, you don't necessarily have a direct career path as well. Right. You know, Um, but in general, it increases your your odds of uh, getting a well paying job out of school, even if it's not music related. Right. You're getting Mm -hmm. a better return on your investment. Uh, and actually, in the video, I originally had Bard um, as one of the 10 schools, Bard Conservatory. But then as I was doing more research, I discovered that Bard mandates a five-year double degree program. Really? It is 100 percent. Yep. You cannot attend the conservatory without being in a double degree. I think like I, I think that solves at least some of the ethical questions there, you know, like. They're trying sure. to give their students, you know, a better chance of success and and making these large, uh, large loans, quote unquote, worth it. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's the first thing. I think that's a path that schools in general could take if they wanted to. I think in general, my second point is bias to what I'm doing now. Right. So right now I'm trying to carve out, like, as you said at the beginning of the podcast, it's a sort of niche in the online content creator community. Um, And there were, there, as I said earlier, a lot of skills I had to learn to be able to do any of this. And if I had had even a small background, or if that had been worked into the program at, you know, Peabody, I definitely would have been better off. I think conservatories, the orchestral world, um, in general, kind of belie what it's like for most 
music students. You know, if some 16, 17, 18 year old comes up to you and says, you know, I'm going to be a rock star when I grow up or I'm going to be a pop star or like I'm going to be an actor. It's not uncommon, you know, like most people would go, okay, sure. Yeah. Cool. No, <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Aren't we all right? And because there's such a system in place for classical mus- musicians, like there's like this sort of path that we're told we can go down and there's all these institutions to back it up and there's all these orchestras and you can have like a full-time tenure job. It makes most classical musicians feel, I think at least at the outset, like there's a path forward. But in reality, for most of us, we're those kids trying to be rock stars. You know, we're Mm -hmm. like, we're trying to the odds are basically the same, but because all these institutions are there sort of disguising it, we don't see it. So I think if institutions can sort of figure out how to teach students to start building online audiences, building their communities, building their audiences in general from the outset, if that is made just as important as sitting in your practice room and practicing, then not only does it, you know, increase students' odds of success in the outside world, but I think it also begins to change sort of um, the culture of classical music in a positive way that's more in line with uh, where our general culture is has shifted to and is continuing to shift to. Yeah, for sure. Um, all great points. Um, I think... If I could add on, I think that uh, there's a lot of people who feel a little forgotten in music school. Like, you know, it's say you, I mean, at Northwestern, I think we had like 25 clarinet students, you know, so like it's hard to be the clarinet. I mean, it's hard, right? It's hard to be the clarinet professor and look every one of those students in the eyes and say, oh, you're going to be the one who, who makes it right when there's five jobs that year. And like most likely none of your students are going to win those jobs. Right. Um, you know, and, and I, I know it takes a long time, but like, you know, those imagine that and then multiply it by 30 because there's probably 30 schools all with clarinet players who have, you know, who want that job. It's just, it's great. And then, and then you also have to take into account all the people that haven't gotten jobs yet that are out there looking still. So the odds are crazy. I think though, that the, teaching and the focus uh, can be more focused on the students rather than the teachers. Because I think there's a lot of like, uh, I think a lot of faculty appointments have been made. uh, And I'm not going to name any names or point out anything specifically because I think it's a broader issue. Um, But I think a lot of people are appointed to faculty positions that just aren't serving the students at all. You know, like I I just don't see any value in having a faculty member that's there once every month and gives somebody a three hour lesson and then kind of lets them go for another month. Like you you need more guidance than that when you're a student. And I also think that like not every student who's there for clarinet wants to do what I'm doing. Not everyone wants a job in an orchestra. Some people want to teach. Some people want to do what you're doing. Some people want to play in shows, which is something that I did. And so I think that the teaching and the education needs to be more catered to whatever the student wants to do with the instrument rather than what the faculty sees as like the epitome of what they're doing. Because every faculty member wants to brag to the other faculty members how many people won jobs in orchestras that year, right? Right. That's what they want for the most part. Or... You know, I I think that there's way too much of a focus on solo repertoire. I I think that that's, you know, in concertos and stuff. I mean, I've never played a concerto with an orchestra. Like, probably never going to, and I don't really care that I am or not. But So, like, why did I spend so much time learning all this concerto when I probably could have spent a lot more time playing in an ensemble with somebody or playing duets with somebody and learn how to, like, adjust intonation? You know, that would have been a lot more useful for me than learning how to play some concerto I'm never going to get to play. Um, sure. I mean, I understand those things are vehicles, uh, right. but I think that, you know, the focus can be shifted. And I also think that there needs to be more focus on how to be a professional. 
because it's hard and it takes a lot of learning on the job. You're often just thrown into the fire. And I was fortunate that I had a lot of people to guide me. Um, they didn't have to guide me, but they chose to. Sure. Uh, and so, you know, there's things that you just learn what to say to people, how to approach people on various issues. Uh, you know, when do you show up to a rehearsal? How do you check this? How do you, how do you, you know, organize your schedule? I don't think enough time is spent teaching people how to do that kind of stuff, how to do your taxes. If you're a freelance musician, I mean, that's incredibly important. All these things I think need to be baked into the curriculum of a music school. And I think we're kind of throwing out all that for in favor of let's just learn how to be better clarinetists, which is fine because you need that too. But is all that really serving the student the best? I don't know. I mean, they, it could be yes, it could be no. I, I don't think there's a perfect answer. Um, sure. I mean, because I think you would probably agree with me. The biggest issue is that there just aren't enough jobs. Yeah. I mean, when it comes right down to it, that is the number one issue. 100%. Yeah. yeah. There just aren't enough jobs. It's the same when people talk about auditions and how auditions need a better system. Well, it doesn't solve the issue of, you know, even if you had a different system of auditioning, auditioning where you like pick someone random every time, like it, it the bottom line is this is there's not enough jobs. So it doesn't matter if you change okay. the system, people are still going to be mad because there's not enough room for everybody at the table. Um, and so I think we can do a better job uh, just in general in academics of really hiring teachers and faculty members that are there to make sure that the students are getting what they need out of music. Um, yeah. And I think and I think that if I'm you know ever in a position where I'm teaching people, I would strive for that because you know there's people that want to play music collegiately and then they want to go do something else and you have right. to help them in that process as much as you have to help someone like me perfect Mendelssohn Scherzo so I can play it on an audition. Um, right. And that's a tough mind shift, I think, for a lot of faculty members because they just, they want to turn a blind eye to all those people, all those kids that spend a lot of money to go to school and now have nothing to show for it. Um, yeah, and I think... Part of it is also just as music students and as graduates redefining what success looks like, you know, when you're done yeah. and and what encompasses a successful music education, even if that means you're never going to play in an orchestra or you're never going to play professionally at all, whether it's, you know, freelancing orchestrally in a band, in a military band, you know you can have had a successful music education without those things. But currently I feel the culture in general doesn't see it that way, right? Not on a grand scale. And, and I think we need to reassess what that means and what that looks like. And yeah. that goes into, I think everything you're saying there. Yeah. I mean, do you have any other, like, like, let me ask you this, like, would you have changed anything about what you did knowing what you know now? Right. So that's the question I asked myself at the end of the video. And for the most part, it, it's I don't think I would have like I know what I was like when I was 18, you know, like right. if someone had sat me down and explained it exactly the way I explained it in that video, I'm pretty sure I would have still said, yeah, but I'll beat the odds, you know, like, <laughs> right. Uh, but I'll be I'll be able to do it. Like, because, you know, when you're when you're 18, first of all, like that's, I was obsessed, right? That's what I wanted to do. I loved it, right? I still love it. I still love it an immense amount. But, you know, that's the age when I was consistently practicing six to eight hours a day and staying out and sneaking, well, maybe not sneaking, but going into the concert hall at midnight and practicing till 2 a.m. And, you know, doing like these things that, I feel that most people aren't doing as they get older, right? You know, like other things enter your life. You have different interests. You have other things you want to do. Um, but it, suffice to say, I was very, very passionate, right? Mm -hmm. Really wanted to do it. Uh, and so knowing that, like, I, I have a feeling that I'd still look at all those numbers and go, yeah, but it'll be fine for me. Um, 
Sorry, I was going somewhere with this. No, it's uh, okay. <laughs> yeah. uh, so, I don't know. I doubt I would have done anything different. You know, really, yeah. like, and I understand. You also, when you're when you're 18, you don't understand, like, well, what happens when you get for your first injury? Like, what are you going to do mm. when? Uh, for me, it was my elbow, you know, like my fingers started to get numb because mm-hmm. like I, I was choking something off at the elbow, like uh, one of the nerves. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, and I had to scale back my practicing and I had to scale back how much I was playing. And, you know, that requires a mental shift. And then when you get out of school, you know, no, no one can really prepare you for like the mental toll of waking up in the morning knowing you have to go to a job, but knowing you also have to get some practicing in before that, going to the job, then practicing afterwards, then telling your friends, no, like, sorry, I can't hang out tonight. I need to practice more after dinner. Right. And doing that day in and day out for months and months and months. And then like, in the meantime, you're still, you're working these jobs. You're not making a lot of money, you know, like it's, it's, very difficult. Sorry, I'm just getting some music through my headphones. No worries. <laughs> no yeah. worries. I don't know technology. where it's coming from. Yeah, technology. Uh, it's not for me. So, um, <laughs> um, yeah, and I, I think you know to to give an answer to my own question. Like, obviously, you know, I am where I am right now, um, and I don't think I would change anything about what I did. But if someone came up to me and said, "Hey," you got to reset from the beginning and you got to go to school again and you're 18 again, do it all again, do it again. I don't think I'd do it, you know, sure. just cause I know all that went into it and all the uncertainties. And, you know, there were years, I mean, years where I woke up every day and I was like, what do I got to do to get closer into my goal? And I didn't right. even know if I would ever reach it. I didn't know. I thought I would, I thought I could, but I didn't know if I would, you know, be in the position I am. Like, there's just no no way of knowing. And so, um, you know, I, like you said at the end of your video, I mean, hats off to everyone going through that right now. It's the two of us absolutely know how difficult it is um, to to be going through that. And and I think just having conversations about it and and making people realize like it's not a no one is unique in this endeavor. It, it everyone struggles and there's always this voice in the back of your mind being like, well, is it time to time to throw it in? You know, is it time to move on to something else? There's always that. But I think that, you know, there are jobs, there will be jobs available. The industry isn't dying. It's not going anywhere. So if you, it's just a matter of how much you want to work for it. And I think that, uh, you know, if, if you wake up every day and you say, I'm going to work really hard for this, Um, I think you absolutely can do it. And, uh, there's no, there's nothing that can replace just the drive and the passion if you have it. So, um, before we leave, Eric, do you have any final thoughts? I know it's, sorry, it's been a little bit of me on a soapbox this episode, but, uh, (laughs) just, I was glad to, to, to to have you on today for sure. Oh, no, thank you so much for having me on. I think, yeah, just, uh, just to reiterate, like, you're not wrong. It's, there are jobs, there will be jobs available and someone has to win them. Right. It's just, if it doesn't happen, you know, you didn't fail because it didn't happen. Right. And there's still, I feel, I feel strongly that we all have something unique to offer the musical world even if that is not an orchestral position and i and i hope that more people can get in that mind frame you know that they do have a unique voice and they do have something to offer the community even if it's not exactly what they envision for themselves yeah and i think that one thing to note too is is that you learn a lot in music school that are transferable skills a ton. I mean, discipline, hard work. Um, I learned, I mean, you and I it, it, just learning all this stuff about 
cameras and filming and editing and all that stuff. I mean, I wouldn't have been able to do that so quickly if I didn't have those skills from music school because I knew exactly what I needed to do in order to get good at it really fast. Um, right. And so, you know, even if at one point in your life you decide, you know what, I, I don't have the passion for this anymore, I don't want to play anymore, anyone who went to music school and and tried to do what we're, we're all trying to do will have will be a great person to work any in any sort of industry. Um, you know, you're a hard worker, your attention to detail is very high, higher than most general people. Um, so music school, you know, I titled this episode, Is Music School Worth It? I absolutely think it is. Um, and I think there are avenues, as we discussed earlier, of getting around this huge financial burden that could potentially come from it. So, right. yeah. Yeah, I, I think um, just to answer that same question, I think it can be, right? Mm -hmm. I think it can be worth it. It yeah. it just depends on the financial reality of, you know, your situation yeah. and what you plan on doing afterwards. It, it's all about your frame of reference and your ultimate goals. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Eric, thank you so much for coming on today. I know this is a... Uh, you you can be a bit under fire for topics like this. I'm sure I'm going to have some interesting comments uh, after this episode is over, but you know, I'm ready for it. <laughs> um, but yeah, you're very, very brave for sharing all that stuff. Uh, again, I, I really respected how objective and fact driven it was. It was really illuminating to kind of just see it all laid out like that. Uh, keep doing what you're doing on YouTube. It's really fantastic stuff. I always go to you for my, uh, equipment review stuff. Uh, so it's, Terrific, and uh, I just can't thank you enough for joining me, man. Thank you so much for having me on, Sam. Of course. So for more information about myself and the Candid Clarinetist podcast, please be sure to follow us on Instagram at the Candid Clarinetist or drop by our website at candidclarinetistpodcast.com. Once again, my name is Sam Rothstein, and thanks for tuning into the Candid Clarinetist podcast. <laughs>